Okay, thank you. So this talk is about constant autoloading in Ruby on Rails. Um, so if, if Ruby on Rails were like normal Ruby applications, you know that if you want to use application controller here and you want to use the post model here, you should uh, require you know, the files uh, where they are defined. It. And uh, this is inconvenient because if you require then, uh, you know, require only loads a file one time, so you, you should need to restart the server or something like that. And if you, instead of require use load, then you are going to, to execute the file, its request, you know, redefining constants and doing all kind of weird stuff. And in the end, it's kind of, you know, it's, there's some redundancy here, right? So you know that Ruby on Rails uh, allows you not to do these things, and indeed it's the, the idiomatic way to, to write, not to put requires. So this thing, it's, you know, it's automatically load, and this thing, it's automatically load for you if needed. So the, the talk is about how this works, and it has three sections. First section, it's a, a constant uh, refresher. Because constant autoloading is like a, a technical topic that eats everything about constants. So we, we, we should have constants you know, fresh in our minds, which are the rules, how they, how they work. Then we are going to, to see how constant autoloading actually um, um, is done. And after that, the third section is about uh, the, the request flow. How, how uh, do we get the constants autoload and then how we get the classes out to load, you know, because in development mode, um, uh, if you change a the file, then the changes automatically without restarting the server are fresh in your application and that kind of stuff. So how does that work? Constants, you all know constants, you are Ruby programmers, so you know they are kind of like a global thing that, that is just like a variable, but it's supposedly not um, uh, going to change. Actually, you know that Ruby allows you to change the constants, but that's like an anecdotal thing. So you know what constants are. And this thing is also a constant assignment, like we, in, in the slide we said before. And uh, some people do not recognize this as a constant assignment, because you have the class keyword and this kind of stuff. So, but indeed, that's like, that's just syntactic sugar for a constant assignment. That's creating a class object. Because you know, in Ruby, everything is objects. It's like there's a small set of actions, and everything is you know, derived from those actions. So in Ruby, we have modules and class objects, and we have constants. And they like, kind of work together, but they are like very, very decoupled things indeed. So when you use the class keyword, you want Ruby, it's constructing a class object, and it's storing that class object in the C constant. It's the same thing in this slide. We are storing one in the, X, in, in the X constant. So here what happens is that there's a class new thing going on behind the scenes and being stored in the C constant. So basically what happens is this behind the scenes. That, that's, that's for real. So that's a normal class definition, class C inherits from D and includes a module. Let's put that example. So what this thing is doing not technically equivalent, but equivalent for the purposes of this talk, is this thing, which is class new. Class new gives you a class object which is anonymous. It's just creating a class object, like you could have a new string, right? Inherit from D and includes N. And then the, the, the result of this expression is a class object which has no name. And after that, if you assign that to a constant, and you see clearly here a constant assignment, like x equals one, right? It's a constant assignment. So if you then assign to C, then you are getting in C an object, because C is not, this is not syntax. This is a constant, like it could be a variable. So this is a constant. When you evaluate this expression, it yields a class object that responds to the, to the name method, and that gives you C. Why gives you C if we, if we define it an anonymous class? Because that's the way, that's the, way the interpreter do, uh, works. The interpreter, when he's uh, executed a constant assignment, it has code that manually says, 
if the thing that you are going to assign to a constant, it's a class or a module, and the class or module are anonymous, I am going to set the name that point. And that name is set in a stone and it's not going to change anymore. But that's happening when you say, when you use the class and module keyword, that's what happens behind the scenes. So, these things that we all take for granted, they are constants, they are not classes. So, properly speaking, a hash is not a class. Like this thing is not a class, this thing is a constant that happens to a store, the built-in thing that uh, it's a class for, uh, you know, that uh, models hash tables, you know? So when we say the hash class, the string class, and we write it like this, we are doing a little abuse of language because what we really mean here is that the class object that it's stored in the, in the hash constant. And the same with the user model and that kind of thing. So, um, they are regular objects, and you can, you can pass them around, store them in other constants, variables, pass them as arguments to methods. You can do all kinds of things. So Ruby has no syntax for class names. It's all constants. And constants are taught in modules. Constants, it, it's, it's a very big topic. I have like a long, long talk only talking about constants. So this is a refresher where I selected like the, 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 the minimal topics that uh, we need to cover in order to, you know, to be able to follow the, the, follow the, the, the next sections. Um, so this is a, a, a snippet from Ruby News uh, where the module class is implemented. And you see, the, the module class uh, has a constant table. So constants belong to modules in a, in a very literal way, you know? There's a, an actual constant table, which is like a hash table. You can um, think about it like a, a symbol table, you know, that stores constants and associates the constants to their value, you know? So constants belong to modules, and top-level constants belong to object. So when you are doing this thing, what you are doing actually is it's, it's creating an entry in that table. So the table that module M has, now it's going to have an, a pair, which is X mapped to one, right? It's, that's the way it works. And uh, let's, let's, let's uh, say it again. This thing is a, is a constant assignment. So we have module XML class sax parser. So this thing is a constant assignment. And this is equivalent to doing this thing. So class new assigned to such parser. You see, this now it's equal, I mean, it looks the same as this thing, you know? Apparently, they are kind of different things, but they are not. So this thing, we write it this way, it's equivalent to this other thing. So what's this doing? The same thing this is doing. This is storing a such parser constant in the constant table of the object that it's stored in the XML constant. So if we spell everything what's happening here, that's the whole story. And you know there's a constant API. So we have const get, const set, remove const. You can ask for the constants of, of so that whole API, it's um, uh, manipulating that table. So const set, it's you know, like creating, uh, you know, an entry in that in the symbol table. Const get is like a hash fetch, you know? So the constants API is about those tables, and those tables are per module. So every module in all your application um, has its own table, and you can manipulate that individual table with this API. I wanted to cover now the constant resolution algorithms because that's crucial to a constant autoloading, how, how, how constant autoloading is resolved. So we have actually three algorithms in Ruby for constant name resolution. First one is this. So uh, x equal one is storing the x, the x constant somewhere. Where? in the table of M. That's clear, right? So M is the module in a scope, let's, let's, let's say that way, 
And this x is stored in that uh, constant table. Here, let's say it again. This is a constant assignment, class users controller. So where is user controller being stored? That's very important. So the, the, the algorithm here is the same for the x, uh, with one tweak that it's in, in the implementation of the class keyword. So, ah, uh, sorry. Uh-huh. So, all right. So, the thing here is, the, uh, the interpreter says, do I have a constant called user's controller in the admin module? If I have that constant, that should yield a class object. I will check it. And if everything looks right, we are going to reopen that class object, right? So that it's looked up in the constant table of module admin. If I don't have it in that constant table, we are going to define a new class. And the constant that's defined as a side effect of that class keyword execution is going to be stored in the constant table of module admin. That's very important because if this algorithm was similar to the to the following algorithms we are going to explain, but you already know. Uh, and, and for instance, if, if the algorithm look it up, this constant also, you know, in the, in the global namespace, we are fucked. Because then we, we would depend on the loading order of things, you know. So this user's controller, even if we have, if we, if we have a top level user's controller, there's not going to be any problem. Because even if there's a user controller in the top level here, define it at that point of execution is not going to be found. So it's, it's a trick. It looks, looks at in the constant table of that module, and if it doesn't exist in that table, you are going to define a new class. Then second um, resolution algorithm is this one. When you have a, a, a constant path, there's no well-defined terminology for this thing. So fully qualified name, uh, constant path, there are several you know, jargon going on in the community. But let's do it, let's say this is a constant path. So when you, when you have this thing, if this, if this um, okay, so what happens here is that x is looked up in the constant table of m. And if it's not found, then you go up the ancestors of m, looking in the constant tables, right? That's what happens here. And the third thing is the generic one, which is the, I guess, statistically is the one that most people use, which is that you have an x here without any qualification. And that's the generic thing. And that goes this way. I call it the 10 o'clock rule, meaning that we are going to, do, to go to the 10, and then we are going to go up to the 12. That means we are going to check x uh, in c. Does it belong to the constant table of c? No. Let's suppose that the, the, the answer is no. We are going upwards to, to the, to the uh, outer a scope, uh, this is technically called the nesting. Uh, so from C, if it's not in C, we are going to check the constant table of N. It's the constant table, so if N has ancestors, they are going to be ignored. So we are going to check the constant table. If it's not in N, then we are going to check M. If M doesn't happen to have the constant either, then we are going to check the ancestors of C. And there's a little trick here. Because if C instead of a class was a module, then the, the uh, object, object does not belong to the ancestors of, mod of modules. Then there's a manual thing in the interpreter written that says if we are, if this, you know, this uh, most nested namespace is a module, then we are going to check object by hand. In the case of classes, no, because in the case of classes, until 1.9, you had always object in the ancestor chain. So actually, in 1.9, we have basic object, and funny things happen with basic object, because if you subclass directly basic object, object does not belong to the ancestors of, of your class, and then you, can, if you cannot even use the object constant there, or the string constant, like, you know, like in a relative name. Why? because object and string are not global classes on anything like that. They are regular Ruby constants, and they follow the resolution algorithms, and since object is not in, you know, in the chains of things we are going to check, they are not found. So you have to do a column-column thing here to, you, to convert that relative name 
to an absolute path and say, hey, we are, we are going to look this up in object. All right, so that's the constant refresher. And we are now going to cover constant autoloading. Constant autoloading, remember, uh, we don't need to require this thing. It's, it's, it, all, it, it all happens you know, on the fly. So here's the thing. There's a, in the constants API, there's a, a thing called cons missing. Cons missing is a hook that it's called if you are in trying to access a constant in some, within some particular module and that constant, constant is not there. And well, so the resolution algorithm that I mentioned before, if they fail to find the constant, there's, there's another loop and calls const missing on the most nested thing, right? So that's a complete algorithm. You, 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 you call const, uh, const missing. Const missing has this information, has, you, sorry. Uh, okay, all right, uh, here. So we have the name of the module that it's gain, you know, that, that it's, uh, whose cons missing is being triggered. You have the name. This is, this is a, a class, you know, the class method that, be, that says the name of yourself, the class or module. And for instance, in that case, the name would, would return the string admin colon colon user controller. User controller. This is a string, All right? And then we have the cons, the cons name. The cons name that, you know, that triggered this thing. And well, in 919, it's passed as a symbol, but that, that's not important. You have the name somehow. So that's, that's the two pieces of information you have about what happened. So Active Support has this uh, set of directories, uh, which, is, uh, which is called Autoload Paths in Race 3.1, I think. And before it was Load Paths, but it was uh, renamed. And Autoload Paths, by default, has all the sub subdirectories of APP. So APP models, APP controllers, uh, APP helpers, and if you throw any subdirectory there, it's pick it up uh, automatically. Presenters or whatever you like to have there, observers, whatever. So Autoload ha paths has this. Um, indeed, I said set, but it's an array because the order is important. So let's say it's an array. And what happens is this. So the situation is that uh, we are here. We are here. Admi module admin, class uses controller, and then uh, let, let, let the example is, is how we autoload the user constant. That's the example we are going to, we are going to, to see. So um, which, this is the information, and this is what happens. Uh, first, we, we loop over all, all these directories, all the autoload paths, and uh, append to the directory this, this, uh, you know, this uh, su uh, uh, suffix. So, uh, if, if I append admin slash users controller slash user v, is there a file there? Let's suppose the answer is no. So we are going to backtrack, and the backtrack uh, tests whether there is a directory with old rv, which is something I am going to cover uh, later on. So let's forget this one. And then there's, there's some assumptions and trade-offs here that are very important that I am going to explain there. Uh, it's, they are not assumptions written in the code. They are implicit assumptions that happen at that point that allow us you know, to, to, to continue looking for the autoload path. Then you, you look for admin user. No? Let's suppose we are going to find a global user, like, which is the normal, you know, the, the normal situation, right? But you, uh, active support tries admin user RB. If it doesn't exist, backtrack and tries also to find a directory. I'm going to explain it why. Then there's another set of assumptions here that are implicit. And finally, if everything is normal, there's a user RB, top level somewhere, probably in APP models, and it's found, it's loaded. Right, so it's load. It returns the, the 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 class whose name is user, and your action, whatever is executed. So that's what happens, and we are trying uh, these things. Here's the thing with the directories. Um, let's suppose we have here. Uh, let's let's suppose we have some workers, and we have uh, organized our workers in a worker directory. So, for instance, you have uh, worker. And then inside worker, event register. And perhaps you have, you have other workers for some queue or something. Okay, so 
in a constant path, constants are single names. So, uh, all right, so here in a constant path, we have two constants. So this is worker, even register is not, is not processed like, like a single unit. They are two constants. And the thing is that uh, you look it up the, the, the worker constant and then inside that module you're going to find event register. So we, we need first to find worker. And worker is autoload. When, auto, when autoload comes back with worker load, then const missing is triggered for event register and the same algorithm runs for event register. So there are two autoloads here. So the first autoload is worker. And if, if you think, in order to have the, the worker namespace defined, you do not need to, to write a worker.rb, right? You organize your workers in, the, in a worker directory, but you do not need to, to write a worker rb file in order to define the worker module. If you have it, it will be executed. It will be find, uh, found and executed, but you, don't, you do not need that. And so, yeah, so if worker rb is not, is not uh, found, then the, direct, the work directory is look it up, and if, if it's found, what happens is that uh, active support defines a module for you. So it does this. In this case, of the worker, would, we assume that it's top level thing. So object is going to have defined module new, and this is assigned to worker. And, and this is a constant assignment, therefore, this module new, which at this point of the, of, of the, of the execution, it's anonymous, is going to end up, after this call, this call is finished, is going to, be, to end up having a, a worker name. So it's apparently everything is as it was defined in the, you know, in the file system. When this happens, uh, we, we keep track to, of a couple of things. One is uh, the fully qualified names of constants you have autoload. Why do you, do you keep track of that? Because we want to be able in development mode to and, and do this thing. And you know, and so that if you change the file in user RB, you are going to, to have this refreshed. So we are going to see later how do we, work, do, do we uh, use this information. But um, uh, so this, this, uh, there's a, there, there are some watchers that monitor new constants coming in after the execution of the RB thing, and they, you know, they store that information for later use. And also, they store the file names. The file names are used to detect uh, circular, circular, you know, constants, uh, autoloading going on. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. All right, and kernel load and kernel require are decorated by active support. Why? Because if you load the user constant, executing, executing the user RB file, and the user RB file happens to require no kogiri, while you are watching the new constants that are coming, you should be able to say, hey, no is a new constant, but that was, was not out to load, right? So uh, there's, a, you know, there's a, a stack of watchers that are pushed by active support while these things happen that are able to say, yes, these constants are relevant. We are going to store these ones, discard them. So there's, a, the stack, there's a stack of watchers that are you know, uh, uh, popping and pushing and, and that, that take care of these things. So you can autoload user, you can require no Kogiri there, and active support is able to distinguish uh, between the two of them. And same thing for, for load. OK. This is the way it works. And this is not the constant resolution algorithm. Why? Because you cannot write, you, can, you cannot emulate constant resolution algorithms with const missing. The first, the first problem is nesting. You, don't, you do not have nesting information. And nest, the nesting, which is the, the, the you know, with, with reflects the scope, the namespaces uh, you have nested, at the point where the constant was missing, uh, um, is not passed to the const missing uh, hook. In the const missing hook, you know who am I, and I know which is the constant that is missing. But 
there's no more information. So, in this example, we have, we have three, three ne different nestings. The first one is the regular one, right? M, N, so in, at this point, the nesting is M, N, M, which is, you know, the namespaces we have. But then, if you do model, um, a module, sorry, M, N, the nesting is just M, N. There's no M. So, active support is going to find uh, in M, N, user RV, if it doesn't find it, it tries M user RV. And if it doesn't find, it tries object of M RV. But in this case, it shouldn't try M user RV because it's not in the nesting. I mean, if Ruby was the one that was resolving that constant, M wouldn't be checked. And this one is even more evil because indeed, if, if you give me a list of modules, arbitrary, I can give you a piece of code that has that list of modules as nesting, arbitrary. It's arbitrary nesting, you cannot assume anything about nesting. In this case, you have module AB, and inside that module AB, module MN, which is the nesting at this point, MN and AB. And active support has no fucking idea of this. You know, it's, it's not passed to the cons missing thing. So you, you, cannot, you cannot know it. So not only you shouldn't be checking M, but in addition to not checking M, you should check AB if you were emulating the algorithm. But you cannot. You, you, do, you do not need. You don't. I mean, in all these examples, if you put here an unknown constant, the same module is triggered for cons missing. But the rest of the thing is missing. So you don't know. And that's, that's uh, even worse. It could be that your model, in, you know, in the generic thing, if you are writing active support, you are, you, you know, you have to deal with the generic thing, uh, with all situations that you can have in Ruby files. One of the situations that the module, the cons missing thing is triggered on, could be anonymous. And there's a, there's a, the, 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 there's a weird thing here. The uh, the eval family of, of methods push, uh, push. Uh, um, Okay, so nesting, uh, I didn't uh, cover this in the, in the refresher, but nesting only changes with module, with the module keyword, and with the class keyword, and with the uh, eval family of methods if they are passed strings. In particular, if you open any block, any kind of block, the nesting isn't touched. In particular, if you say class eval block, the nesting isn't taught. The nesting is, is very, very lexical thing. So you, if you look at the source code, you, you, you see which modules are there defined, that's the nesting. At that point, it's in the source code, you can see that. And, but there's an exception. If you do module eval or instance eval or class eval, and you pass a string as an argument, then Ruby, when ev evaluates that string, pushes the other module. In particular, it could be an anonymous module. So this is very, very edge case, but happen. So in this situation, you don't have no fucking idea of what's an anything. You don't even have a, a name for the module. You don't, you don't even have a name. So you don't, have the, you don't have the nesting. But even there's no name, so you cannot assume anything. So uh, these are trade-offs done by active support. Trade-off, the name of the module that gets it to the, 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 the hook, call it, reflects the nesting. That's an assumption. It's known that it could be false. But you do that trade-off because you cannot do anything else. You, you, can, you cannot be smarter than this. And so this is the assumption that you are basically in this situation. And for anonymous modules, you cannot do anything. So the, the, what active support does, it assumes that the nesting is object, that you are yeah, you know, the, your lexical scope, it's uh, the top level scope. So you have to do something. That's what it does in anonymous modules, but fortunately, thanks, thanks to the fact that uh, blocks do not push the nesting, the only edge case that where this can happen is with uh, a valve family that receives strings as arguments. The other thing that you don't know is which is the, the algorithm that failed to find the constant. So, if the algorithm is the one for relative constant names, like this one, uh, this, this thing is going to find one, which is a top-level constant. Why? Because it checks in M, 
in M is not defined, let's assume that. Ancestors, there's no ancestors for M, then it checks object. So you find X, right? So here, this works. But if you, instead of doing MX this way, you do it this way, the constant is not, is not found. Why? Because it checks in the table, it's not in the table, finish. And you know what? This thing and this thing is going to trigger the same call. You know in M that X was not found, and you know your name, which is M, but you don't know the algorithm that triggered this thing. So the trade-off here is something that is, you know, it's a partial solution because there's no solution for this. So if active support receives a constant and checks the, you know, it goes up the nesting or at the assumed nesting, if it finds that constant defined in some of the parent modules, then it says, hey, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be uh, this case, because otherwise the hook wouldn't have triggered it in the first place. Right? But why is a partial solution? Because, because it depends of, of the constants that are defined at that point of execution. So it could be, you know, depending on the load order or depends on the, on the code path, uh, you know, execution, mm, you know, but it's the best you can do. So another thing that, that you, may, you may have noticed is that ancestors are not fault. So active support does this backtracking, which is like following the nesting, but it, it does not attempt to find the ancestors of the originating module and try to find directories for those ancestors and, and start the game, right? So the corollary of all this is, which is a, uh, you know, a very important key of this talk, is that active support does not pretend to emulate the constant algorithm. Why? Because it can't. So the thing is, you have to, to, to think about this in, 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 the, in a positive way, which is active support provides you this feature, which is if you use constants this way, and you follow the conventions and, 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 you know, and, and write the files in the, in the, in the, uh, following the conventions, then that, that's the contract. That's what's going to work. If you expect that active support uh, solves any you know, resolution of, of uh, constants in uh, you know, following the generic rules of Ruby, it's not going to work, but that's not the contract. You know? So uh, there are these in, in, you know, in, uh, essential limitations and that's the contract active support um, uh, offers. So let's go with, uh, all right, yeah, I, I, I think I can, I, can, I can finish the presentation. So uh, request flow. Request flow uh, depend on, on cache classes. Cla cache classes, you know, um, it's the, the flag that says whether you want your classes to be reload or not, which in, in development mode by default, it's true. Uh, so cache no, so it's false, and you know in production mode uh, you don't have to code reload. Um, so for doing this, in, uh, uh, it was it was uh, simpler before, but in three two there has been some optimizations. There's a, a thing called file update checker that that it's able, given a, a series of directories and file names, it's able to say whether uh, from the previous execution something changed, basically. So it happens an API that says, hey, your set of things has been updated from the previous call. It, it, it implements that kind of thing. And then we have some, uh, okay, some uh, AG configuration things that are not generally very used, but they exist, which is autoload one's path. You are, you are able to say to active support, hey, autoload these things, but only once, so do not reload. And some people use it, for instance, to autoload from lib. Some people like to autoload from lib, but, not, but do not have lib reload. And they put lib in autoload once path. The only thing is that uh, in a very, very uh, little use cases, people want to actually say, hey, this constant, I know it's not autoload, but please unload this constant for me. Because I am developing some gem or something and I am, you know, uh, tr trying with an application, and, and I want my gem to be reloaded. So they, you can put in explicitly unloadable unlo constants uh, this thing. And then in active support, uh, sorry, in active support, uh, in, in, in the application uh, rail type, 
there's this thing that says, well, if you want to reload things, we are going to push a middleware. And this middleware uh, looks for these things, the, the routes, the locales, and the application files. And it works this way. If the, if the routes are changed, the routes are out, uh, uh, load again, and the constants are gone. So the way this happens, the, the way reloading happens, is that the constants that were uh, uh, loaded are removed from the constant tables of the A modules. So if root change, roots and classes are, are um, reload. If locales change, they are loaded and also are reloaded the classes. And finally, if Ruby um, files are changed or if schema RB of a structure SQL are changed, classes are going to be reloaded. So that's the thing. If, if, the, if the file if the file, uh, files change, uh, the constants are going to be wiped from the constant table of the modules. And for doing that, you just use, you know, the, 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 you, you have uh, stored the constants that you auto load. You have the API to remove the constants. You remove the constants by hand. And since you remove the constants in the next request, uh, when you are going to use the user model, the user constant, again, is unknown. Why? Because the constant is wiped. The user model, the, the user class, could be stored somewhere else theoretically. So you are not, you're not really reloading the class. The class could be alive somewhere else if you store it, which is a bad practice, but it could happen theoretically. What you remove is the user constant. You, if, if, the user constant if the user class is stored somewhere else, what you cannot going to do is uh, access to that class object using the user constant. That's not, you are not going to be able to do that. But the user class is independent of the user constant, could be stored somewhere else. But in any case, you've removed the, use, the user constant. So when you are going to use the user constant again in the next, in the next request, const missing is triggered again. And that closed the loop. And that's the presentation. All right. All right, do we have uh, questions? Can you change the name of the constant or a module once it's assigned? Or is it like blocked by the interpreter? Yeah, good question. So. Again, let's let's do that. Let's do the point. Constants are just just storage, just storage, and you have you, you happen to have a constant table in the module. So since Ruby allows you to change a constant, you could. You could. You you get a warning, but you can. So in that sense, storing a a, a class, you know, this thing like uh, module M class C. This, this C assignment inside, inside the constant table of M is no different than, than doing C equals one. So you can change any of those. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking about, uh, you have this, uh, the, the class object, for example, user, user class that you assign to the, to the user constant, right? And you then uh, like execute the algorithm for, for removing the, the user class from the table. So then when you, when you, for example, store the user class under, under a variable, if you do the variable dot name, does it have the name of the user and can you change the, the name? The name, no. There's no okay. API. I don't know whether if you have C code, you could do some weird stuff. But uh, let's say that way. There's no mm -hmm. API to change the, you cannot change the name. Okay. That, that's controlled by the interpreter. All right, thank you. Yes. What would happen? What would happen if you said like class dot new do like x equals self dot name inside as you're defining the class? Yeah. So you remember that I said they are not exactly equivalent. Mm -hmm. So the, when you do the assignment and the class and, and, the, and the definition with the class keyword, they are equivalent as for the purposes that. But I said there's not there's some details. One of these details is that that if you if you say class C and body definition, when you are in the body definition, the, 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 se the self at the top level of the body, which is the class, has the name defined. 
because when 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 the interpreter process, 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 processes it, uh, the class keyword, it, at that point the name was set. Yeah. But uh, that, that, that that that's a good observation because if you say class new block, yeah. indeed at that point what this that's one of the little differences. At that point the class has no name; it's anonymous. So if you say self name. Uh, uh, at that point of the, you know, within the block, effectively you get nil. I think it's nil in one nine. Uh, this has changed. In one, in, in one of them was an empty string and the other one was nil. A any, in any case, within the block, the class is anonymous. And if you check the name, it's anonymous. It's when you have done the assignment that you get the name. And the assignment in that example, in the slide, was like immediately done, but you could let, you could say class new, store that in a variable, yeah. and half hour passed, then you assign that variable to that to some constant, let's say C. It's at that point that you get the name, right? Yeah. Yes? Here, hi. Uh, very short question, what presentation software are you using? Sorry, what, what's... Here, hi. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, unrelated question, but what presentation software are you using here? <laughs> so yeah, that's, nice. that's a really nasty and dirty Ruby script that I wrote for this <laughs> conference. <laughs> so it's where do you find it? All right, all right. What? No, I wrote it. Oh, where do you find it? <laughs> so <laughs> okay, give it to okay. Me. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> all right. So it's <laughs> it's <laughs> it's. <laughs> I'm going to be ashamed. <laughs> okay, I publish it anonymously. <laughs> it looks very good. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, in Rails. To point X, uh, lib directory was in auto load path. Yes. And in three, it is not. Yes. By default, you can always add it back. That's right. And some people add, add lib directory to auto load path, and some people uh, use uh, required dependency to load the, to reload their uh, classes. Uh, can you explain what which way is better or uh, how they differ? Yeah, I mean. Um, um, that was like a, a kind of a philosophical uh, decision, which was that, look, lib, it's kind of like vendor, but it's closer to my application, to my company, or something like that. And some people in core felt that lib did not belong to the, lib, to the directories you should autoload. And if, um, for, for pro in production mode, uh, if you run um, uh, Passenger with, with uh, Ruby Enterprise Edition, or if you are in, th in thread safe mode, uh, since constant autoloading, which is, I mean, this topic is big. Uh, there's many things that I've left, but some of the topics which are interesting is that constant autoloading is not thread safe. So since, since it's not thread safe, Ruby, uh, sorry, Rails, needs to execute all your files in the autoload path in, a, in order to be able to, to, to have controlled when you... Uh, so, in production mode, constant autoloading happens, but it doesn't happen on demand. So, there's a, in the boot process, you go and execute everything. Constant autoloading still happens, because you could execute users controller.rb and have a country constant in the top level and that comes to country constant. If country, country RB has not been load, it's still going to trigger some constant missing. So constant autoloading still happens. But uh, that all, that's all execute in, uh, in boot time before you start to do any threat or anything. Right, so the, the thing is, uh, there was a discussion internally, should we uh, execute everything in leap? And the answer was, it doesn't look safe. You could have strange things in lib, like templates or stuff that you don't you do not want to have executed automatically by the framework. <coughs> so that was like the decision to say, okay, let's let's uh, keep lib out of this, you know, automatic thing, and 
and you know, and uh, uh, all right. So only go for ABP. Now, which is the best practice? It depends. It depends on your application, and in the end, at the end of the day, it's something that that is your. I mean, some people like to have everything autoload. I do. I, I put a lip in autoload, and some people don't. I don't know. It depends on you. So I, my answer is there's no best practice. So do do the thing that uh, that you like. Okay. Uh, one last question. Um, so if you're a cool kid and you add like services and presenters, I'm right there. Yeah. Okay. Services and presenters and stuff like that to your app. Uh, so you put them under app. Um, can you namespace them? So like you have a sign up service. Does it have to be called sign up service? Or you, you can call it like service column column sign up. Okay, so you, if you have app services, it acts uh, as far as the things we've seen, it acts exactly well that app controllers. So you can name space. Uh, so when when we said when we saw those examples, when we we, did, we looked for partial paths, those partial paths are checked against all the directories in the autoload paths. In, in particular, if you have app services be, uh, among those directories, um, so you, you will get the namespace resolve. So you can do both, actually. Both what? I mean, uh, your class and the app services can be called um, sign up service or services column column sign up. That's right. That's it. Oh, that's uh, yeah. It does stuff. There's a hack around it, but you don't want to hack around it. So. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sharia. All right. Okay. Thank you.